Good evening, and welcome to Salon Concerts at Clavierhaus. I'm Farhan Malik, filling in for Jed Disler. This series was created by our departed friend, Joseph Patrich, and it continues thanks to the generosity of Clavier House. It gives our artists the opportunity to perform on a top quality piano in an intimate setting, while the live streaming and archiving further broadens the reach of each concert. I encourage everyone to check out the magnificent instruments here at Clavier House showroom or online at clavierhouse.com where you can browse the available inventory and learn about their expert piano restoration services. A salon Concerts relies on donations. Thanks to our fiscal sponsor, Piano One Park, a nonprofit organization, donations to support Salon Concerts are tax deductible. We are extremely happy to report that our tier one goals for the calendar year have been reached. That means that all donations from now until November 30th will be added up and divided among all the performers this year. Contributions of any size are welcomed, so now is the time to show your support for all the performers who work so hard to bring you the music that you enjoy every week. A big thank you to everyone who has already contributed to support the Salon Concert Series. You can find instructions for contributing on the donation box near the entrance or on the website salon.clavierhouse.com. And you can stay updated on Salon Concerts by following them on YouTube, Instagram at Salon Concerts, and Facebook at Salon Concerts NYC. Today we have a extraordinary program, uh, very unusual and full of pieces that are r rarely heard. And I'd like to make an exception today and say a little bit about the pieces since they are, some of them are lesser known. So uh, I'll start with the first half and then I'll talk about the second half after the intermission. So today, and the program is available at the door if, if you saw it on the way in or if you want to look at it. Uh, so we begin with Hungarian Rhapsody number 17. And uh, when most people think of the Hungarian Rhapsodies, we think of these pieces with gypsy themes, starts with a slow improvisatory section and then has a fast virtuosic uh, called Friska, so frisky section. Uh, but Hungarian Rhapsody number 17 is not like that because what happened is after he wrote his first 15 Hungarian Rhapsodies, there was a 30 year gap before he returned to the genre. And in those 30 years, his writing style had changed drastically. So Rhapsodies 16, 17, and 18 are written in late list style. And this means the harmonic language is different. And this piece actually has only one section, one main theme, and it lasts only about three minutes. So it's very unlike the other Rhapsodies. Uh, after that, we have the Toccata, which is another late list piece, very rarely heard. And as the name implies, the Toccata, it's a fingery piece, but it's not like these typical Toccatas, which are really huge and bangy and show off -y. it's it is virtuosic, but it's sort of uh, almost a little bit classic in style, and it's also very short. So it's sort of an unusual piece even for Liszt's late period. Uh, next we have Elegy Number no. Two, and uh, this is uh, one of the favored uh, late Liszt pieces. It has a very plaintive melody, as you would expect for an elegy and it builds to a very Listian climax. So it's a very effective piece. Uh, after that is Mazeppa, which is a very well-known piece, one of the transatlantic etudes, so uh, I won't, won't speak about that. And then we have three pieces from the Aneda Perlinage. And so the first two, we are from book one and book two, which represent, again, lists earlier in middle style writing. But then the third piece is from book three, which was written many years later and represents this late style. So here you have a 
real chance to contrast how Liszt's middle and earlier style was versus the late writing. And again, in the late writing, uh, you know, the, the third piece, all Cyprus de la Ville d'Este, it's called Threnody, which also means like elegy. So it's written in a completely different style. And one way to think of it is in the earlier pieces, he's composing for an audience because he was still a performing virtuoso. And in his late pieces, he had retired from this kind of public performance. And in many ways, he was writing for himself. Um, next piece, Bagatelle Without Tonality. So this piece was actually not published until 1955, so long after Liszt died. And the title is very forward-looking. We think of Schoenberg and atonal music, but actually the piece is not like that. Uh, the reason it's without tonality is because he just keeps meandering and jumping around, uh, never stays long enough in any key to really establish a key, but it's not kind of modern atonal music. And in fact, uh, it's kind of a playful piece. Uh, next we have impromptu, and the main thing I'd say about this piece is, you know, the late list pieces, they weren't really taken up by a lot of the most famous pianists. But this one is an exception because uh, Vladimir Ashkenazi played it, and even Vladimir Horowitz took up this piece. So it's one of the ones that kind of got a little more accepted. And we end the half with the Grand Galop Chromatique, which I'll just say is one of Liszt's most flashy showpieces, and it's a fun way to end the half. So please welcome Michael Kaker.
uh, welcome back to Salon Concerts at Clavier House. So for our second half, we have two monumental works of the piano literature. And the Busoni Fantasia Contrapuntistica is about 30 minutes long, and it's a very complex piece. So I'm going to try to explain it a little bit because uh, it's possible uh, many of you have never heard it before. And so I'm going to give you some, some little guide to the piece to make it easier to follow along. So this piece was inspired by Bach's Art of the Fugue. And it's written in 12 sections. But the sections often run together, so it's actually not that easy to identify the sections. So first I'll tell you what the sections are. We start with a chorale prelude. Then we have three fugues, then an intermezzo, then three variations, a cadenza, a fourth fugue, a chorale, and then strata. So now the chorale prelude is the longest part of the piece. It goes for about eight minutes. So you'll hear there are several pauses in that chorale prelude, but it's not the start of a, another section. And then you have the three fugues, which it proceeds into immediately the first fugue and the second fugue. Then you have a little break before the third fugue. And the third fugue is on the motive B-A-C-H, which in English, it doesn't make sense, but in German, B means B flat, A and C means C, and H is B natural. So you have this little motive. You know, oops. And of course, uh, he's not the first person to do that. Bach himself did that in the order of the fugue, and then Liszt wrote pieces based on that. So it's a little play with words, you know, to spell his name. Um, so then structurally, even though this piece is in 12 parts, so the chorale prelude's about eight minutes, and then the third fugue is the second longest piece, and that's about six minutes. So when you get through the chorale prelude and the three fugues, that's four of the 12 pieces, you're already two thirds of the way through the piece. So then the last eight movements are all very short and each one is less than two minutes. So the last eight combined take up only 10 minutes. So it's sort of a interesting balance. And again, there's no pauses. So everything just goes one into the other and just, uh, just builds and uh, so then the second piece we're going to hear is Sarabji Sonata Number no. 1, which is a natural piece to follow because it's dedicated to Busoni. And Sarabji is a very interesting and unusual composer. Uh, so first, most composers want people to play their music. Sarabji actually instituted a ban on people playing his music, and for 40 years, no one was supposed to play his music. And the reason for that is his music is so complex and so difficult that he heard someone play part of one of his pieces. And it took twice as long as it's supposed to take. And it was played so badly. And then he got terrible reviews of his music. And after that, he said, nobody, I don't want anybody playing my music. You know, they're, they're ruining it. And then it wasn't until 40 years later where he lifted the band because he, a couple of pianists approached him and they played the music satisfactorily and he decided, okay, uh, people can play my music again. So you can't really describe this music in words, but it's a, about 22 minutes piece. It's in one movement. It's kind of influenced by late Scriabin and then of course influenced by Busoni, but it's much more uh, futuristic. Uh, really, you just have to hear it. It's just waves of sound and ornamentation and color and harmonies. And, and it's, if you've never heard this kind of music, it's, it's quite overwhelming and probably unlike anything you've ever heard before. So let's please welcome Yi Chang Huan.
So we'll just take a few minutes to set up and then we'll have an interview with both of today's performers. So uh, we're going to do the interview. Uh, uh, Chang is not feeling well, and he, he uh, doesn't feel like he can speak. So uh, uh, we're just going to talk, the two of us. OK. So uh, maybe we should sit somewhere or something. Um, let's maybe grab chairs and sit. Yeah. OK. A little bit less awkward this way. OK. So. The first question I want to ask you is, it's a somewhat unusual program that you presented with a lot of you know, late list works, which are not known. So can you tell me what attracts you to these late list works and why you are playing them? Well, a list is often not given enough credit just for how innovative his music is. and. The general kind of criticism that people voice is that list is just virtuosity and kind of empty, and that you know this really can't be further from the truth. And you can find a lot of particularly interesting textures and innovative harmonies going all the way back to his compositions in the 1830s. That being said, by the late period, he really explored a lot of things 
new in terms of harmony. We would later see these things in, in late Scraven, for instance. But what really attracts me to this list that you can pair some of the earlier works with something that's totally in a different style, but still sounds like the same composer. Yes, because uh, you know they say that this late music it was written. He was you know in his 60s and his 70s, and uh, even some other pianists like Horowitz, he didn't add that impromptu until he was you know over 80. So it's not considered a young man's music, uh, but you look fairly young, and you know you clearly enjoy this music, and. Uh, do you plan to explore it further or? Yeah, absolutely. So this is um, part of a preparation for albums that I'm doing as an ongoing series for Audra Deck Records. So volume, List Unrivaled Volume 2 is about to come out. And this current concert was actually a first performance of many of the works that I'm going to actually do for the third album. The exact repertoire is up for debate. I have to kind of settle in it with the label, but it's just an ongoing all list album series, which I'm not sure when I'll stop, but I can anticipate it's maybe 10 or 20 albums easily, just to cover all the favorites, just to cover all the favorite works. I see. Well, 10 or 20 CDs, it's obviously gonna be covering all periods of list then. Yes, yeah. yes, well, very soon I'll actually run out of the later later compositions because I played the second Mephisto, third Mephisto, Mephisto Polka, Rhapsody number 19, that's, by the way, coming out the next installment uh, for Audra Deck Records. So at some point, I am gonna run out of the late work, so I have to just sprinkle them in carefully for the albums, just to use them kind of sparingly. So with all this list that you're doing, do you have time for anything else? Of course, but this it's right now it's a priority. Right now it's a priority. I teach a lot and I practice and prepare for albums. If it wasn't for this kind of series and just taking the initiative to pursue projects I really feel strongly about, then it's very easy to lose motivation to play, to perform. It's very difficult. It's like an extra sort of thing you have to force yourself to do. Take time out of your day to prep for this. So I'm, I'm very grateful I have something like this ongoing series uh, to prep for. Yeah. Yeah, And it sounds like 10 or 20 albums is like a reasonable because yes. you know what they said about Leslie Howard when he decided to do the complete list and 100 CDs and someone made a joke and when he was you know very far into the series like he probably hates getting up out of bed every morning thinking oh <laughs> you know, well, he also discovered a lot of new works I mean there's there's been the complete series and then there's like there's additional albums that he issued titled new discoveries like volume one Volume two, album Leafs. So there, I think there's probably gonna be more, we'll see. Whenever something, whenever enough material comes up for a new CD, he's gonna release more, I think. Yeah, yeah. and have you thought uh, after List, have, is there something else you'd really wanna focus I on? I thought of incorporating other albums to continue the List series, but incorporate albums by other composers. Uh, my doctorate, was focused on the works of Scraben, particularly the late works, and I did a lot of sort of theoretical analyses of Scraben. And then getting so entrenched in it, I kind of lost the desire to play much Scraben, so I just went for List, which who I adore, absolutely adore. But yes, I think other albums by other composers are will be sprinkled in as well. Yes, we'll see when. Okay. Does anyone have any questions they'd like to ask? Or? If not, thank you for a wonderful thank you. concert. Thank you for hosting us. It's really, really a pleasure, and okay. thank you for including us in the series. Yeah. It was a kind so of a came as a surprise. Came as a surprise. Yeah. So I'm just a temporary host today, so I didn't, I don't make those decisions. But I'm glad I was able to host this concert because it was really uh, a special event and the sort of thing you rarely <laughs> see. And so uh, it was a great pleasure for me. And my pleasure. Thank you. Thanks. And uh, I just have a few announcements to close. Uh, so once again, thanks to Thank Michael you. and Yu Chi Chang. And so tomorrow, there are two concerts here at Clavier House at 2 o'clock. 
Uh, Visha Nguyen Voskresensky is playing the Bach Goldberg variations in a concert dedicated to the memory of Joe Patrich, the founder of this series. And at 6 p.m., Yi Cheng Huang is going to be back to play Morsarovji, Simonovsky, and works by Samuel Feinberg. Um, and last, I'd just like to encourage if you want to support the series, please donate so that we can support the artists and keep the series going. Uh, thank you everyone for coming. Thank you. Thank you.